Hello, everybody. I hope you can hear me. Uh, I don't think anyone can respond. So if you can hear me, would someone mind putting something in the chat just to confirm that this is all functional? Woohoo! Look at all of that. That's lovely. Thank you very much, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining. Yesterday morning, US time, Mark Zuckerberg and Sundar Pichai and Jack Dorsey, the CEOs of Facebook, Google, and Twitter, spent a few hours discussing the power of social platforms in today's democracies, media, and economies. As a data platform for the modern digital economy, we at Data Swift have also been regularly asking ourselves similar questions about these companies' power and their influence. Professor Irene Ng is the CEO of Data Swift, and she's an academic expert in market design and digital economies. We're lucky to be joined with her today for her talk on regulating the damn economy. This afternoon's session is scheduled for about 30 minutes, so it'll include a QA. and um, I will also say that if I know Irene and our audiences, it may well run a little long as well. So if you have to leave before the end, please don't worry, that's okay. If you have any questions, please save them for the end when we will have time to field them one by one. And finally, we find that these events make for great networking. So if you would like to meet and connect with fellow attendees after the session today, please share your name, your job title, and the company that you work for in the chat. And that way, people will be able to find you afterwards on LinkedIn. With all of that said, it is my great pleasure to welcome Professor Irene Ng. Thank you very much for joining us, Irene. Over to you. Hi, everyone. Uh, hi, I'm Irene. Um, great to see everyone. Uh, not the best of circumstances. Um, today, I am told by my wonderful team that I'm to talk to you about economy, which clearly because I've talked enough to them, they've decided that they don't want to hear any more from me and um, they've sent me out. So let me just start if technology works. Uh, can I just check, like Jonathan did, that you can all hear me? Uh, just put something on the chat to say yes. Excellent. Fantastic. And I'm going to share my screen now and uh, I can't see. So I assume that it's all is good. But if it's not, somebody uh, please tell me. Can you see my screen? Which, of course, is a, you know, draws the effect of everybody chatting. And if I get a yes, good. I will now move on to the other tab. Right. Um, today I will talk to you about the economy and what I mean by the damn economy. Um, some of you who have read my blog talking about data, tension, and money. Um, some of the insights from um, a, a particular service we have in Data Swift called Data Swift Observatory. Um, I will be talking a little bit about the redistribution and regulation of tech and uh, money. So this is the familiar uh, chart that uh, diagram that I tend to use a lot uh, about data and personal data creating and interacting with platforms, social media, search purchases, location, everything. Uh, mostly controlled by um, GAFA, Google, Apple, Facebook, um, Amazon, and of course, some would like to include Microsoft, some would like to include Netflix, you can just keep going. Um, but, and, and everybody knows money, because they tend to come onto platforms through purchases of app, purchases within app, and advertising. So it's in-app, app, and ad. That's where the money is. And then the third one, which some quarters have talked about it um, in terms of um, our media diet and attention, but very rarely do we kind of join the three up. And when I join the three up, I really do them mean the damn economy. Now, before I go on, let me just explain to you a few things. Well, one thing anyway. Uh, most of those in the room who are economists will know how an economic multiplier works. When a dollar enters the economy, uh, demand increases, and hopefully more people are hired and then there is increasing increased spending and additional dollar becomes available to be spent and the dollar enters the economy again. So the point of an economic multiplier is that we want to encourage people to spend because that creates more jobs and more demand and increased spending. That's literally how economic multipliers are defined in normal traditional economic 101. We all know the data economy, it's everywhere. But the wonderful thing about this little diagram I put up, which I deliberately just put up this diagram, 
is that you would look at it and you think this has nothing to do with me. Nothing at all. This is some out there data economy. Um, it's all about identity matching, integration, customer management, advertising, nothing to do with me. Well, it does. And it's a very, very big economy. And we've been watching it and analyzing it for some time. When in, in terms of what it has to do with you, why are you not coming down? Uh-oh. Uh-oh. Went up again. Okay, sorry. I think there's a bit of a lag due to Wi-Fi. Here we go. Um, the advertising data economy, let's just use that as an example. The data can enter the GAFA economy by maybe you going on the browser, you um, going into YouTube. Data about what you've done gets transformed to an insight about you and the algorithm is refined. And then it tries to infer, what are you doing, Irene? Are you trying to buy a pair of boots or are you trying to buy uh, socks? And so it starts to generate a profile and it then gets shared within the platform. It doesn't necessarily have to go out, but it gets shared. And this just keeps going on. Every click, everything you touch, just basically transform itself into an insight about who we are. What are you trying to do? It's, it has all the intentions of trying to sell you more things or trying to flash the right ad for you at the right time. Now, it's not moving down again. Ugh, why do I do that? Why does it do that? Okay. Now, the attention economy, I'd like to talk a little bit about that. It's about the hours of the day. You only have about maybe 10, 12, 13, 14 hours of waking periods. And in 12 to 14 hours, what are you looking at? Now, it wasn't a big deal before because what you were looking at was very varied in that 12, 14 hours. You could be outside in the sun, looking at grass, trees, you could be eating a meal, talking to people. But increasingly, our eyes are looking at a screen. And once you look at a screen, then everything you ingest, everything you consume becomes part of a diet. So imagine you are eating and you bring food into your body, that's your diet. In a similar way, when you are looking at a screen, whatever you are looking at is a diet. Now, if you're looking at a chessboard because you're playing chess or you're looking at music or video, it's all part of a diet. And diet happens to be very important because if you spend many hours um, looking at something, it can change your mind. So if you were eating and you ate a lot of candy, it would make you obese or fat. But if you, in a similar way, if you are reading stuff that can make you, a bit, that can influence you, you could be, and, and make you addicted to the screen, addicted to what you're trying to do, like games in some ways, it is uh, it's addictive and it becomes uh, junk food similar to junk food for, for your media diet. Anyway, you get the gist of what I'm trying to say. Um, what it generally means is the more aware we are about how we consume with our eyes, the more we are aware whether we should or and how should we have a, you know, a balanced diet. I caught my husband once um, spewing some funny uh, opinions, which I thought was a little bit odd. And so I uh, sneak a peek at his iPad and said to him, darling, can I have a look at your screen time, and I found that he spent about two hours on a particular piece of news magazine that I think would be very, very inappropriate for his media diet. We discussed it, and he said, yeah, I think that uh, we should adjust that, and I, so we adjusted that, and his anxiety has um, much reduced since then. So let me say, media diet is important, guys. Now, what, is, what happens with your daily media diet? Here's an example. You could have watched a YouTube video. video. You could have gone online and then uh, read interesting articles, played with some apps, and all you've learned on that. All this is good. This is good. It's part of our learning. Media and looking at screens is not necessarily a bad thing. It helps with enriching us. It helps us laugh. It helps us, you know, um, it helps our well-being. Much like food is. And just as candy is bad for you, 
overall, you need to ingest food, otherwise you won't survive. The dam economy works in all three of them work together. And here is an example. Let's say in the, you have an intention over the next eight hours, you wish to spend about, you want to spend $50. You want to be entertained. You want to watch a movie. So you start today thinking, you know what? I want to watch a movie. Let's say we are still in the 1990s. We want to go out and watch a movie, $10. We want to go read a book, um, buy a book for $10. Um, I want to learn and make a banana cake. Um, that would be $30. So I'm willing to spend $50 in the next eight hours on a book, a movie, and learning to make a banana cake. That's eight hours. Okay, let's, let's have a look. First, uh, of course, you pick up the screen and the first thing you did was you, the first hour was just spent surfing. I mean, you know, you go on the, the browser, you start the surfing. And then in the uh, in hours two and three, you kind of watch the YouTube movie and you had it for free. And in your fourth hour, you read some really interesting articles. So that's five hours gone and it was free too. Um, and in hours six and seven, you found an app that gave you cake making lessons and they were charging you $25 per annum. And so you bought the app and then you started to bake a banana cake. That was your eight hours. Eight hours that day. This is a typical day. What is interesting is you haven't spent $50. If you've noticed, you've spent $25 for the whole year for making cakes and app for the whole year. So you can see how a traditional economy that would have spent $50 have now shrunk to very marginal spending but you're still getting everything that you wanted to get when you woke up in the morning, just with much, much less money. Now, what happens is that's eight hours of attention, but, and you were entertained, you were educated, and you learned how to make banana cake and you spent $25 for the whole year of baking lessons. But what happened is the moment you started surfing, you also started to generate data that enters the GAF economy. The data got transformed into an insight about you. An algorithm became refined, just trying to find out what is she doing? What exactly would, would she want to do next? Intention is then inferred as to what you might want to do. And a profile about you is generated. That is data. Somewhere, maybe not today, maybe not yesterday, but in a very different universe, some kind of advertising dollars did come into the GAF economy. Some advertisers somewhere uploaded an app, an, an ad. It chose that these ads should be shown to women of a certain age if they were interested to bake cakes. It found a match from your surfing and buying the app. It then served the ad to all the places that you were looking. So that is the money economy from ads. Now, if you look at these three economies, they are all interlinked. There was only two amounts of money here the money from the ad, and the money you paid for $25 on the ad per annum. What I'm trying to say here is, there's a lot going on and they are all linked. And when they are all linked, do you know how many industries are linked here? There is a cake making industry here, there is an entertainment industry here, that advertising crosses every consumer industry. So when we start to think about the damn economy. Oh, it's not moving. Let me try again. Oh. Where is the economic multiply? Well, you can say the dollar entered the economy, demand did increase, more people are hired and increased spending. Where is the money going to? 
Well, let's just pick the top two. The first, clearly, when the marginal cost of serving this ad, this ad economy, you just remember these three little circles, as more and more ads get served and more and more um, people go online with the attention and more and more data is being generated. Remember, there is hardly any marginal cost. They didn't have to build something to sell. This entire damn economy have near negligible marginal cost, whether it's 100,000 people or 10 million people. So therefore, all the money comes into profits, revenues and the profits. So it's now down to the GAFA economy on where they want to spend the money. Well, where are the people hired and where's the increased spending? Entrepreneurs and investment markets, typical. Ad dollar enters the GAF economy, demand increases for ads, profit increase because marginal cost is negligible. They spend on acquisitions, additional dollars, sitting with successful entrepreneurs. If you look at the retained earnings of Google and if you look at how much profits they've had, literally you can see there. You can do all kinds of interesting trickle-down effects and you know leak analysis around that, that particular model. Uh, key takeaways, you can see all the billion dollar acquisition they have had over the last 10 years from GAFA. That's where a lot of money has gone. Entrepreneurs, investment money. The second place it has gone is the data value chain for MarTech. Oh, look, MarTech, the marketing technology landscape. So Google does pay. It pays a lot through demand side and supply side platforms. Many more players have joined in. So it's added to the whole economy. It still comes through GAFA in some way, often, and you will see the huge increase in MarTech landscape over the last nine years alone. And so there are a lot of logos, so a lot of companies are benefiting. But what's really interesting is there are so many companies that it has exploded to in the marketing technology landscape to serve that damn economy. What it what is interesting is the growth of the marketing technology landscape of seven years is extraterritorial. That means it's not in America, it's not in the UK, it's not in Europe, it's not geographical, it is global. This is the internet, the country. So this is why I want to be very careful to say, when you're talking about the growth of the economy, it's all economies, it's not America, it's not Europe. So when we think about regulation, we've got to be careful and think about what potentially we are regulating here because there's a huge potential downward spiral. Because the reason why is, uh, there's a potential downward spiral is what you saw was just a person and a person's eight hours going online. Think about it this way. The damn economy is now physical. Let's say today you went to see a doctor, bought medicine at the pharmacy, did some yoga exercises and went to sleep. That is nothing to do with the online world. And yet the result is you've generated payment data, you've generated a medical health record, yoga app activity and sleep data, all of which have entered the gut economy in some way or tech economy in some way. And with the next time you go online, it will serve up ads and content. So the damn economy is not online. It's also offline in physical. And I've got people who say, well, if that's the case, I'm not going online anymore. I said, and I always say, you do know that Amazon has bought Whole Foods. So after you buy that very nice ball of cauliflower and you go to the till and you purchase, is that an online or offline purchase? Because I guarantee you, that till is not a standalone unconnected till. It is an online till. The damn economy is a digital connected service economy. It exhibits some key characteristics. The hiring landscape has changed. We don't hire within company anymore. You have entrepreneurs out there. You have new businesses out there. Um, and an effect of more ads in one country ends up with more people being hired in a different country. The spending landscape has changed. Your $50 have turned into $25 per year and all the entertainment you need, all the baking lessons you need as well. These are very tightly coupled systems. All the institutions and logic are locked in. 
your is a system that exhibits negligible marginal cost, lots of profit. And remember, as you go through cables that went from twisted pair to copper wire to fiber optics, more and more content is going through the pipe. Speed of content is increasing. And so the it's not just the multiplier that it creates across the whole world. It is creating more every day because we're able, the, the internet is able to take increasingly higher and higher speeds. So the biggest multiplier therefore come from the value chains. And when you think about the value chains, what is really interesting is to think about it. Oh, stuck again. Oh no. Where am I? Value chains. That's right. Because if you think about the value chain, all the data that's coming out from your attention, data and money is now coming out from banking. And this is typically the open banking data value chain in India, Brazil and the UK. And it's also coming out in US healthcare. So all your healthcare is coming out. So it could spiral. Everything that GAFA touches is extraterritorial. The internet is the country. And so when you want to regulate, the first question to ask is, where's the boundary you are thinking of? I have to tell you about the other way of doing it, which is redistribution. And what we are trying to do in data service, of course, to move from the damn economy to the data economy 2.0. What do we mean? Well, I'm a market design economist. What I try to do is try to say, look, we have some interesting things going on. The economy has sudden, uh, obviously improved. Many jobs were created. We should retain the multiplier effects. We should promote economic growth. But what we need to do is improve the distribution of economic activity and wealth. And wealth distribution, this is my shameless plug for DataSwift, is to say, give everyone a personal data account legally own, make every data transaction a legal contract, move away from centralized system, make personal data a new asset class. And so what I wanted to show you the last few slides is to basically explain how we do it at the observatory in, in DataSwift. We have many apps coming to build on personal data accounts. The type one apps read and write into their own personal vote folders. For those of you who are not familiar with the personal data account, it's actually a personal data server spun out immediately for an individual. It's legally owned by the individual. And of course it acts like a bank account for your data and every contract of giving data is a legal contract. And so we've got quite a number of apps coming to read and write to their own folders, they store, very much the same as logging with Facebook, logging with Google. You can log in with your own personal data server, personal data account, and we have apps that do, these are what we call type one apps. And, we, and here's a case study of Redeem Recycling uh, Clothing who, who stores the app inside and basically, thank you Redeem, um, the, da the data inside the PDA belongs to me. We also have a data economy 2.0 applications where basically they have an user app and they have a dashboard app like a Mito who basically use it for contact tracing or some of our ever other apps that use it for HR. Um, when the company has to upload all kinds of uh, personal data around HR and they put it into their own folder in the PDA. And so that's the case study. And there's a third type, which is really interesting. Um, who decided that they'll put the data in, but they also want to take data out. For example, um, giving you a second chance for a loan in Brazil or a second chance for insurance discount. And they ask you for Facebook, and would you take Facebook data, help, and they won't take it, they will create a credit score out of it and tell you, ask you if you need, if you would like to have a second chance for a loan. And, and that's one zero me and they are uh, pretty much piloting in, in uh, Brazil right now. What we are seeing in the observatory of all our apps and the ecosystem, we see an evolution of a lot of data coming from different parts of the different sectors, moving into a lot of the new apps that are built on PDAs, which is interesting because they are building new capabilities using some of the old data. And um, some of these different types of apps, some come from um, you know, non-data sensitive sectors, they just need it for compliant and trusted storage. Um, some want to be much more data intensive, so they use it for double-sided markets. And of course, the very data intensive one 
will use different kinds of data to create new algorithms for their world. What I'm trying to explain here is a different way of looking at redistributing the data, the dam economy, to say, if we could look at asset flows as data that belong to centralized systems at the bottom, what we call data economy 1.0, and then say, um, move, redistribute that to a data economy 2.0 through personal data accounts where it's legally belonging to individuals. You then have a mechanism through which data as a wealth creator and an asset can actually be redistributed. And that's what Emerging Data Economy 2.0 is all about for us. And we're doing quite interesting work in asset flows for Data Economy 2.0 in capturing um, what those asset flows are. We absolutely do not know who these PDAs are, of course. It's pretty much like central banking um, and viewing uh, different kinds of asset flows that are moving between the old economy and the old uh, and the new economy. Shameless plug, if you're interested to watch The Revolution, please sign up to Data Swift Observatory. Um, if you want to be part of the revolution, please build amazing data-rich applications. Um, we have a new city sandbox at uh, City of Illyria and data, for Data Economy 2.0. Please talk to any of Data Swift VPs who would love to talk to you. Regulation, yes, we should not lock down data assets into silos. The economy depends on it. Yes, people should feel safe to transact. Redistribution, yes, markets can redistribute uh, economic benefits and wealth. They can and should work with a regulation. And so we believe in regulation and we believe in redistribution. Thank you. Where do I go? Thank you very much, Irene. You're in the right place. Stay where you are. Um, anyone who is interested, so thank I you very much. That was wonderful. Um, I think a very good illustration of some of the transitions that we're seeing um, sort of highlighted by the uh, effects of regulation and by, and by what's happening in the media at the moment. Uh, I've got a question to kick us off, and I wonder as well um, if anyone else does. If you do, please feel free to um, post a question in the Q&A, um, and uh, either myself or someone from the team will um, flag it and highlight it, and then we will pass it on up for, um, for an answer from Irene. Irene, from me first. Um, what kinds of indicators do you suggest we keep an eye out for out of the regulation of the dam economy that will start to show more of the transition towards what we're talking about? Um, and is there a sense that you can give us as to how things of sort of the dam economy, the, the, the conventional economy that we're in now, are likely to respond as the change happens? Yeah, I think um, many of the tech giants do understand that there clearly is an issue and a challenge. And where everyone differ in terms of opinion is what to do about it. Um, I think I've mentioned this before <laughs> and uh, we'll mention it again. There's an old saying that says we, we have, we have a paleontology Paleolithic emotions, medieval institutions, and godlike technology. Um, and so we look at godlike technology thinking that they can save our medieval institutions, but they can't. <laughs> okay, we need to reform and evolve our medieval institutions. It always lags behind. And so, what are the things that we should look for? Well, I think um, start. Uh, what I was gratified by was the the fact that um, there is issue around Section Two Three Zero, the issue around antitrust, uh, four hundred and forty nine page document on it. What I'm gratified by is the government is finally taking notice that something needs to be done. That's one thing I'm happy about. Something needs to be done, and it start and and when you have something that needs to be done then it just everybody gets into action. Mm. The worst is to have people believe that there is, that, that everything's fine. Mm. Uh, we're finally caught to a place where we know everything is not fine, which is a good start. With that in mind, do you feel like there's a difference in the uh, regulatory activity of what's been taking place now compared to the last round of big antitrust motion that happened with Microsoft and the others? 
oh my god back in the day that was i mean come on the world was so different then you know and don't forget the antitrust of microsoft um internet explorer was to help a small fledgling little startup called google you know um it's and you will see that they come in cycles right because success begets uh, problems but there's been a lot of wealth that's been created we need to recognize that there's a lot of good that's been done yeah. recognize that is a problem is one thing. Deciding what to do about it is another. And second, when you have tightly connected markets like this now, um, it becomes a lot harder to unravel. You've got to really know where the market boundaries are. And they are not the traditional market boundaries. This is not a railroad system, you know, and um, where, where market boundaries are clearly defined. They are not. I think the first thing they have to do, which my, uh, from my perspective, is transparency. There are all kind of funny deals going on in Gulf economy. I know quite a few of them where the world doesn't even know these contracts and how these data flows exist. Um, we just need them to be much more mm. transparent. And then you would know where the market boundaries are. Then we can have an honest discussion about what we can do about it. That's great. Thank you very much. Uh, we have a question from David Rowley, who's asked, what path should groups, associations, clubs, um, take and organizations i'm guessing take in order to interact in a manner that fosters the growth of personal data accounts of its members so what kinds of actions can organizations take um everyone has a website right almost every organization and the moment you have a login at the top just please don't log in with facebook and google log in with the personal data account for us we don't really uh, care so much we issue uh, pdas everywhere in the world it's a bit like email accounts in the early days right um once you've got one you can log into multiple apps with it um so in any way shape or form um there are a finite number two billion people you know once everybody has a personal data account then apps can tr thrive you know we unfortunately we might cook we might create another Google again, I don't know. But the point of the matter is the asset stays with the individual and these flows will happen and becomes like a bank account. You start to have a regular economy again where individuals have more purchasing power, whether through money or data. Um, how do you issue PDAs? Any website that needs a login, any place that you need to store, even the simplest PII data, whether email, just issue a PDA. That's, that's about it. You know, it takes about one, two weeks and you can just do that you start small and it becomes bigger and bigger it's just like I, we tend to look at it as email accounts i mean how do email accounts get get to be a global thing you know it just started with a uh, university starting to use it and it opens up and then everybody started to use it thanks very much that's actually a nice pivot into the next question too which says um how do you empower people to think of their data as if it's part of an asset class when up until now it has been used for free um, and do you see there being a thing to help the shift take place Interestingly, I didn't go very much in PSA Club. I get asked this a lot. I say <laughs> the reason why we, flow, you know, when we issue and then there's the the asset flows that flows. At some point, you buy back your own PDA, right? Because the asset flows, um, I mean, your the asset flows through your PDA should generate you monthly kind of yields. Um, you don't have to value your data that way. It's not a commodity. It's the idea that data is a forms a part of what you interact with with apps. You shouldn't be top of mind saying, oh, this is my data, it's very precious. No, you should go and get your yoga app and do this. If they're working on PDAs, you are automatically protected, you're automatically secure. You just do get on with your life. And then later, if you want to, you can go to your dashboard and cancel some apps if you want to, or have a look at how much yield that PDA has given you. But it shouldn't be top of mind, and it should never be like that because uh, data isn't gold, not something you can touch and feel. It's something that flows from a PDA to, to create that value with new apps and, and new economy. Do you believe that if we had um, grown into having digital currency before we had physical currency, that we would view currency the same way? And is there a parallel between the transfer of money for services and the transfer of data for services? It's quite funny. Um, 
if you read uh, Amsterdam Wissel Bank, I can't remember what the name is, the first central bank, um, they, they were formed because um, a, lot of com a lot of people had, a lot of countries had currencies. The problem is every time you had a currency, um, people were nipping off the silver, <laughs> clipping off the silver at the side. And so the, the, the value of its content, you know, the silver, was higher than the nominal value of that one cent. And it was quite funny. And the reason they started to issue current paper or IOUs was to then say, we need a way of which we can trade. Data suffers from a very similar position. This is the reason why we redesigned the, the economy this way. Um, the content of who you are and what you are, it's, it's a different value from the flows within the BDA account, which could be value based on the flow and how much is being used. And that separation is really important. People think of value of data as though there is um, a, a content value versus a nominal value. They have both, but the world has never caught nominal value of data flow before because only Google knows. <laughs> because they can see it in their system, no one else can see it, right? Yeah. And so that's caused a lot of the evolution up until now. This has been wonderful. I appreciate it. Thank you so much, Irene. I think that there will be five or so minutes for networking afterwards. So if you do want to just pop into a room where you can see other people that you'd like to meet, please do so. Otherwise, thank you very much, Irene, for all of your time today. And I look forward to seeing you at the next one. Thank you.